It's December 1st, 2021. It is the last episode for the year. We better make it a good one. You are listening to Crime After Crime, and I'm John Lorden. And it's me, Danielle Hallen, and he just put the pressure on. It's got to be good, Danielle. <laughs> He's like, if your story's not good, you're getting booted. <laughs> oh, we're done. <laughs> yeah. I've already got Stephanie's number in my speed dial. <laughs> Kicking her out. You can find me on my farm sitting in the middle of a field. Yeah, yeah. Crying. I'm crying. I used to have a podcast. Um, Yeah, Danielle, the end of the year, mm-hmm. the holidays, New Year's, all mm-hmm. kinds of stuff going on. Anything in particular that you're looking forward to around all this time? I just really love Christmas. I do. Mm. I've already got my house completely covered in lights. Really? It's been covered in lights when you're hearing this for about a month. <laughs> <laughs> you have to yes. send me a picture. I think I think it's, last time we were talking about this. Yeah, yeah. I'm so excited. Covered in lights. It looks so pretty. I don't know. I've been awesome. listening to Christmas music for a long time now. I just love the overall like joy of it. Everyone seems happier and mm-hmm. it just, I feel like I get like my refill. Does that make any sense? Yes. Like, I just feel like my cup overflows this time of year. It's great. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. My wife goes on this tear where all of a sudden, like every night she's watching a different Christmas movie of some kind like oh, you know these great netflix like oh, yeah. hallmark cheesy uh, ones cheesy yes yeah, super mm-hmm. super cheesy it's got like one actor you know from something and no one yeah. else you recognize oh yeah <laughs> falling in love in a small town exactly where they randomly met up and family yeah. is crazy yeah, th- yeah. it's great but are it's you like watching it any good ones old. yeah no not right now i, I okay. did watch home alone last night Oh, well, that's a classic. That is such a classic. I love it. And my son, I swear, I'm dressing him up Mm -hmm. as Kevin next year for (laughs) Halloween, whether he wants to or not. He's going to have his hair slicked back in the green towel with the comb. Oh, he looks just like him. Blonde hair and everything. I told him last night, I was like, decided. (laughs) You don't get to choose your Halloween costume next year. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Uh, Yeah, I've got to get in my favorite holiday movie, uh, Mm -hmm. Die Hard pretty soon oh my goodness (laughs) which is a christmas movie don't start the arguments i know it's been heavily debated online it's a total we've already argued about this before (laughs) yeah come on it's a total christmas movie okay now i have a gun ho 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 (laughs) okay um it's time for us to get through the results for last episode we talked about faked deaths and i really I didn't know that that topic was going to be so good. I was really proud. It was of, awesome. Yeah, the stories that came out. Uh, Danielle told the story of a swimming Scotsman and his son, who didn't seem to really think their plans and lies all the way through. And I told the story of a man who went as far as stealing the identity of a dead person to fake his own death and collect on life insurance, then give his ex-wife the money. I still don't understand that. Me either. I think about it to this day. Yeah, but how did it all play out, Danielle? What happened? Well, to be quite frank, I got my butt kicked again. Oh! (laughs) I did. John came back for a comeback, I'm telling you. (laughs) Like, big time. And he didn't even have to send his war flies over. So at 28%, that's what I got on the website poll. John got 72%. And then on Twitter, I received 31% of the votes. And John got 69%. There's still no cup exchange. How am I supposed to drink any hot cocoa? It's staying over season? here. It's staying over <laughs> here. And oh, the cocoa's so good in it. Oh, my goodness. <laughs> I'm pretty jealous. It's a shame, Danielle. It's a shame. It is. It's a shame. Uh, a big thank you to everyone that voted. If you voted for me or Danielle, mm-hmm. and can I keep the streak going today? I don't know. The topic we're looking into real life Grinches. The classic Dr. Seuss story introduced us to a character that has become a holiday staple. And if he was a real person would certainly have wound up being discussed on this show. Mm-hmm. Uh, as a matter of fact, he might have wound up in the Florida man episode. Just, he seems like <laughs> He yeah. seems like he'd be hanging out in Florida. Yep. Uh, the Boston Globe wrote an article in 2015 asking if all these criminal acts would land the Grinch in real world jail. 
The article noted that the Grinch could potentially face a felony charge of theft above $250, along with counts of breaking and entering for every who house he hit. Animal cruelty would be on the table for his treatment of Max, that poor little dog, with the tied on antlers who was absolutely way too small to drag that giant sleigh. Mm -hmm. There's even a possibility of a hate crime charge, given that the Grinch targeted those who celebrate Christmas. And we can't forget about his stealing the identity of Santa Claus. This, I mean, seriously, this guy is That's just... a long list. He's racking it up. Mm -hmm. uh, Bob Harnace, the president of the Massachusetts Bar Association, figured out a good legal defense for the Grinch, though. He suggested the Grinch's heart condition could sway a jury, especially if he could actually prove that his heart had grown three sizes that day. Quote, unfortunately, he's a disabled person. His heart is the size of a peanut. Harnais said. You know what that reminds me of? That reminds me of that one legal defense your guy had that he was too fat. Oh, the too fat, right. The too fat to kill story. Yeah. Oh my goodness. <laughs> His yeah, heart's he just, couldn't, he's yeah. got a heart condition. <laughs> I couldn't step up the four stairs before I shot the person. Yes. Yeah. Jeez. <laughs> now, ultimately, the legal experts agreed because the Grinch saw the error of his ways, he would likely avoid hard jail time. Attorney General Mara Healy said the Grinch made the right move when he showed up at the Whoville feast and carved the roast beast, and she'd recommend no jail time for the Grinch's actions. Quote, you have to think about what is the sentence that would be most appropriate, Healy said. Here, I think that he will do more good by performing and continuing down his path of community service, end quote. She said she would like to see him return to Whoville every year to perform additional community service, such as cleaning the chimneys. Now, if we can pretend I'm in Whoville so mine could be cleaned this year, that would be great. <laughs> um, another fun thing I bumped into around all the research on this, Danielle, is uh, do you know who the Grinch is about? No, I actually don't. It's about Dr. Seuss. He was in his early 50s. It was just after the holiday season. And he remembered, he got up in the morning, he was looking in the mirror to shave or something, and he didn't recognize the person he was staring at. He could just see this guy that was so cranky and old and didn't believe in Christmas anymore. So he wrote The Grinch about himself. Oh, that is crazy. I never knew that. Isn't that? And then think about all the lyrics too. Like, you know. Oh my gosh. You really yep. are a heel. Yeah. <laughs> you know, yep. Stink, stink, stunk. I, I mean, he's just beating himself <laughs> I know. Up. He's over here just going in on himself. <laughs> Poor guy. <laughs> yeah. I thought that was a really cool aspect of the story. And there's, you know, part of the thing he was trying to comment on was like the commercialism of Christmas and stuff yep. like that. Oh, and yeah. That's mm -hmm. kind of still in there. Like, you know, they have all their decorations and the Grinch is stealing all their decorations yeah. and the special food and all that. So you can see that it's almost like a little debate he was having with himself. He also considered like hundreds of different endings. It took him forever. Oh, that's interesting. I would love to know what other options I would were. too. Yeah. Yeah. It took him forever to land on that particular ending. But I think it was a good one to end on. It was worth it. Yeah, for sure. All right, the criminals that we're talking about today embody the Grinch in some significant way, but it's as if they brought his spirit to the real world. Will their hearts grow three sizes? Let's find out with a story from the amazing and talented Danielle Hallen. Man, you guys, this was a hard research, but I think I may have hit the nail on the head because when I think of the Grinch, I think about the sneaky way he dropped into homes, grabbed up all the things that people loved, and disappeared into thin air, leaving no trace. He seemed to put so much effort into taking all of the presents and decorations, but not much thought into what to do with them after other than simply destroying them. And eventually his heart grew and he gave them back. And the story that I have today sounds eerily similar and is well known as the biggest heist in San Francisco history on the night of Christmas Eve, 1978. Mm, I don't know this. I'm excited. I know. I feel like I want to do like a playwright with it, like enter screen left. Like <laughs> <laughs> Start rhyming everything. <laughs> I know exactly. Look, it was very tempting for me, but I didn't yeah. do that. Yeah. What rhymes with San Francisco, by the way? That'd, that'd be a tough one. I'll get back to you. Now I'm going to have that stuck in my head all day. <laughs> Crisco, San Francisco. <laughs> I, I don't know. 
<laughs> At the time, the De Young Fine Arts Museum, located in Golden State Park, San Francisco, was undergoing renovations. Being the nation's fifth most visited art museum, needed to always look its best and prepare for new up and coming exhibits. The museum features art from the 17th through the 21st century, and at the time, it was preparing to welcome the King Tut exhibit. And because of this, the entire East End was being heavily worked on. Housing priceless history, you would assume the museum typically had very tight security, ensuring that nobody with bad intentions could sneak off with any of the masterpieces. But that didn't always deter every criminal, and their security may not have been as up to par as believed. Mm. For example, just four months prior to Christmas that year, someone had made their way into the museum around midnight armed with a pellet gun. Okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting choice. Attempting to steal a Rembrandt known as Portrait of a Rabbi, along with two other paintings. They shoved these beloved art pieces into a plastic bag. Okay. We won't go there. So very yeah. upsetting to hear that before yeah. being taken down by a guard. The bag didn't end up being snagged and the paintings were saved, but the thief escaped. So the San Francisco Chronicle posted a piece about a few months later, just before Christmas, joking about the lack of security at museums while they transitioned from exhibit to exhibit, which again required construction. The piece outlined how easily it would be for a skilled burglar to work their way up the scaffolding, cut in through an upstairs window, and get into the building without triggering any sort of alarm. Can we take a moment to discuss responsible journalism, please? Exactly. Exactly. <laughs> oh, What the heck? The entire article literally outlined a perfect plan for a criminal to act out. I mean, probably even giving things away that most people would not know. I mean, I, you know, I, I understand wanting to raise awareness to those issues, obviously. But, but you don't lay out blueprints. <laughs> no. Well, and even if you do, like maybe it's something you send yeah. to them first. And then after you know that they've rectified those issues, yep. then you publicize, oh, by the way, this is a scenario we thought about. We called and told mm -hmm. them, so don't try to do this. But this is something that w used to be a problem. Mm -hmm. I you mean, it the whole article even spoke about specifically the King Tut exhibit. It had been in New York and there were actually some thefts there. Like, the, I mean, yeah, <laughs> they were just yeah. really putting on blast. Hey, look, this is a good idea. <laughs> Here you go. If you want to get into this museum. Yeah. So it seems possible that the original thief that seemed down on their luck decided to have a second go. Or this journalist just put out a brilliant idea that someone took advantage of. Mm -hmm. Because on Christmas morning, several guests walked into the De Young Museum to large empty spaces on the walls of Gallery 12 and 13 with signs reading, temporarily removed. Mm. Dun, dun, dun. Imagine that. <laughs> wow. Uh, I keep picturing like a 75-year-old mm -hmm. security person like, you know, leaning back in the chair mm -hmm. with his hat pulled down, you know, his little yep. name tag I'm says Wally. You, yeah. This needs to be a play. <laughs> <laughs> I've got visions. If anyone wants to hit me up on this and help me out. <laughs> yeah. Wally so, the security guard. <laughs> <laughs> you want to play that? <laughs> yes. I want to be Wally. <laughs> <laughs> now, it turned out on Christmas Eve, instead of stealing presents, the Grinch stole that same Rembrandt along with three other Dutch paintings from De Young Museum, the same Rembrandt that was tried to take months earlier. Now, police arrived on scene to investigate how the paintings had been stolen. The museum had closed at five o'clock Christmas Eve and the two security guards on duty that night, as well as the two morning security guards, said they didn't hear or see a thing. It wasn't until the museum actually opened at 9 a.m. that anyone realized that these paintings were missing. So how could someone have made their way into the building without triggering alarms or security? The Chronicle knows. Further investigation showed just how haphazard and lucky this criminal was. The thieves, or at least one thief, gained access to the roof of the museum on the East End, where the alarm was no longer working thanks to the construction of the King Tut exhibit. From there, they made their way to the west end of the museum to take advantage of a skylight that dropped directly down into galleries 12 and 13. Wow. Wow. So they're like going down a rope like uh, Tom Cruise and Mission Impossible or something? They still don't know how they wow. got down. Wow. Okay. They, don't, they really okay. don't. They've never figured out. The metal bindings of the 3 by 5 skylight had been unscrewed, oddly. These skylights were completely unprotected by alarms. Yeah. 
Yeah. Of course. The thief dropped down eight feet from there to a catwalk in the gallery, which then gave them access to the gallery ceiling that was only protected by a plastic grate. Once this grate was removed, they lowered themselves down another 12 feet into the gallery like, and I quote, a bizarro Santa Claus. <laughs> That's how they were described, a bizarro Santa Claus. Mm -hmm. It seemed as if these thieves took the joking article and turned it into an actual plan. They clearly cased the museum beforehand, knowing where the construction was, knowing about the skylight. Police even believed they used technology that informed them of where the ultrasonic motion detectors were in the museum and where they weren't. Because galleries 12 and 13 were the only galleries not protected by the devices. Wow. Even the restaurant was protected by infrared. Wow. The restaurant, Jeez. don't you take my turkey sandwich. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, they're, they're protecting the roast beast in there. Absolutely. But a million dollar Rembrandt, go for it. <laughs> the thieves managed to snag this Rembrandt portrait of a rabbi from its frame, valued at, as I said, $1 million. But the three other paintings were pretty much of no value at all in comparison, which really puzzled authorities. You know, despite this plan seeming to have possibly been acted out by a professional the less valuable paintings kind of made it seem like a rookie job interior of st lawrence in rotterdam was taken that had a fifty-five thousand dollar value to it which is still a lot yeah. but when yeah. you're comparing that to like one million right um harbor scene however which was taken was only valued at five thousand and river scene at night only two thousand might be easier to move those Mm -hmm. You know, the Rembrandt one is so famous, like maybe that's the one that they're keeping in their home mm -hmm. and then they're going to move the others and sell them. I don't know. Yep. Now, a handful of other paintings, some also valued around one million, had been taken down from their hooks, but for some reason were not hoisted up the 20 foot drop to the roof. They mm -hmm. were just left behind. Now, it was theorized that the thief or thieves may have worried about being caught, and that is why they didn't take these other paintings. So the reason it's believed it was actually more than one person is because in order to get those paintings back up, these thieves moved a 600-pound, $10,000 antique chest. <laughs> what? They pushed it under the open grate and pulled the drawers out to create makeshift steps. Wow, wow, wow. But one person isn't gonna move that 600, pe no. or 600 pound piece. Yeah, no, 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 no. But man, could you imagine this? I'm telling you, something out of Dr. Seuss. Pull mm -hmm. that the drawers out one by one, creating stairs, <laughs> and just hop your way out of the roof, right? And it makes piano noises when you walk exactly. up. Exactly. Dum, 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 dum. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but apparently, when moving either the chest or going up and down it, they shattered a light bulb. Okay. And so authorities thought this maybe prompted them to quickly leave, thinking mm. that someone would hear them, which, spoiler alert, they didn't. Uh, so they left all of these other valuable paintings behind. Everyone was flabbergasted at how easily these thieves managed to steal so many paintings and the media went absolutely wild at the lack of security in the museum. The alarm system wasn't on on a major portion of the roof. The skylights had no alarm on them at all. And we've all watched way too many James Bond movies to think that's a good idea. <laughs> Two galleries holding millions of dollars of art had no motion sensors or infrared. Yeah. And when the guards were questioned, they didn't even physically go into gallery 12 when they made their rounds. So they simply walked into gallery 13, briefly directed their flashlight into gallery 12 and then left. Man. Uh-huh. Nothing. And then even more disappointing, and probably one of my favorite parts, I mean, not really, well, is that when the guards did their rounds, usually each gallery had a box that the guards would put their key in. Yeah. And this kind of, you know, keeps a log of these locations when they were checked. It offers a small form of security. However, just prior to this, the box by Gallery 13 was removed to save the museum. Get this. You ready? To save them $100. <laughs> Oh, well, yeah. Well, now it makes sense. <laughs> the device that, that you use to make sure the guards are coming by, yeah, we'll save a hundred bucks. That didn't work out as they planned. No, no, it didn't. So none of the guards were thought to possibly be involved, despite the fact that the obvious knowledge of thieves had 
could indicate it was one of them, but there were many demands to have them fired as they did pretty much no part in spanning the gap of lack of security. The museum's director of security, Salvatore Priolo, didn't even argue when critics came on strong. He said, and I quote, they're not telling me anything I didn't already know. Yeah. 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 He seemed very like, yep, well, I knew that was going to happen. Mm. Yeah, police finally fully ruled out security themselves and began to try to figure out who could have pulled this off without sending alert or while sending alerts to worldwide galleries to keep an eye out for these paintings. Since the museum was clearly cased beforehand, they decided to look into individuals that had recently come to the museum. And because it was possibly linked to the other theft, it could just be coincidence it was the same painting. Not likely. They also kind of compared that to the previous attempted heist. Now, this ultimately led authorities to a mysterious 30 to 35-year-old man driving a station wagon. Okay. Witnesses came forward claiming that at around 9 p.m. Christmas Eve, a man was seen in a station wagon driving into the rear parking lot of the museum with a large ladder tied down to the top of his car. Mm, so now okay. we're like, we got like Christmas vacation vibes in here as well. <laughs> so we're just mixing it all together here. Yeah. <laughs> But the lack of security they had gave them nothing else to go off of. They checked for tire marks, footprints, anything, nothing. There's literally just this one witness. So the FBI and Interpol eventually joined the investigation. But after going through hundreds of possible persons of interest, just kind of grabbing names out of a hat and following every lead they had, they had nothing. The paintings didn't show up in any other galleries worldwide, and no one really gave a solid tip. So at this point, they brought in the only officer in the entire country that was assigned to art theft full-time, Robert Robert Volpe. I'm already oh, thought, tripping on the words. I thought it was going to be Wally. Wally. Wally, the security guard. Wally, the security guard. <laughs> now, Robert, Robert Volpe. Robert okay. Volpe. His okay. last name gives me troubles. I don't know why. <laughs> but Robert believed that this was a contract hit. That the okay. Rembrandt was the main item the customer wanted taken. And the thieves likely took the smaller ones for themselves, which kind of makes things make a little bit of sense. Yeah. This was the only thing that really explained how these paintings weren't showing up for sale anywhere else because they were hanging in someone's personal collection. Mm -hmm. But the FBI didn't really believe this. They said that the painting was too valuable. Someone would likely want to sell it, not just sit on it. However, we may never know why this Grinch decided to act out that Christmas Eve. In a shocking twist of events, across the country, 20 years later on November 2nd, 1999, a 30 by 45 inch crate was dropped off by a man in a wig at Doyle Galleries in New York City. Doyle Galleries is an auction house that appraises fine art, jewelry, furniture, other miscellaneous items. And every Tuesday, I believe it is, they would have this big event. And this night, it was particularly busy. But you can imagine their shock when they find this crate with no person along with it, only a note that says that the crate contained none other than the stolen paintings from the de Young. All of them? Mm -hmm, that's what it said. Whoa. Well, that's what it said. Immediately, the FBI bomb squad showed up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right off the bat. They're like, mm, after 20 years, there has to be something more to this. There has yeah. to be, right? Yeah. There's another trick. There's a bomb in this. This is someone pulling a hoax. But they opened it up. It was just the paintings. They seized the package. The paintings, however, did not fare very well. They were scratched. They were split. They were Ooh. warped. A few of them were done on really thin wood, and one of them was in three separate pieces. Mm. There had been a few less than professional restorations <laughs> okay. and cleanings of the paintings that ended in smear marks. There were corners missing. The poor rabbi's face was essentially gone. Oh, wow. The harbor scene painting, the $2,000 painting, it wasn't even there. I'm sure if anything happened to it, someone was like, eh, toss it. Right, right. But investigators were puzzled. Clearly, the paintings had never been sold, likely weren't sitting in someone's mansion based on the way they were. But you would assume that at this point, if if no one really wanted them or didn't want them in their house, didn't want to sell them, they would have just been disposed of, not returned on the other side of the country 20 years later. Yeah, yeah. Three days after the paintings had been dropped off at the gallery, someone called in claiming to be a man named Carl LaFung 
and he himself had dropped the paintings off. He said that he was worried that the de Young Museum weren't going to get their paintings back. He wanted to make sure that those paintings that he dropped off in New York were sent back to the museum. Now, he tells everyone that he somehow got his hands on the stolen paintings from the original thieves. He said that he didn't have a part in that. That's not believed. And he said that fear really took a hold of him and that he didn't want to get in trouble and he didn't want to have the paintings in his possession anymore. So he thought he would disguise himself as a man in a wig and drop them off at Doyle, who would be able to confirm it was the paintings and send it back to the museum. Now, once it was published that the paintings were in fact being sent back to DeYoung, Mr. Fung called again with a sense of relief, saying that he believed he did the right thing by returning the damaged paintings and he would never be heard from again. So it seems that this man's heart did in fact grow three times in size that day. <laughs> now, the three paintings remained on display at DeYoung for a short period of time. They actually had a big sign above it saying the three stolen paintings. It was like a big yeah. deal. Yeah. They looked awful. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> like absolutely awful. Uh, but they did end up being removed and sent to other galleries around the world. But Mr. Fung was never identified, nor to the nor do the FBI to this day have any suspects in the heist. And they said that they don't think they ever will. So this Christmas heist remains a mystery. Huge hmm. thank you to San Francisco, Gay, New York Times, and the Washington Post for this very, very grinchy story. Did we look into the writer of the article? Is his last name Fung? <laughs> I'm telling you. Yeah. Whoo! One of the things I was wondering, especially hearing that they um, weren't in quite the same shape mm -hmm. or status when they came back, I was thinking, oh, is someone trying to make knockoffs and then return the knockoffs mm -hmm. so that they could have the other ones freed up? But I would bet they did some type of verification on it to make sure. Oh, yeah. Yeah, so there was verification. It was, in fact, all of the original paintings. Ironically, it actually caused this huge debate about the Rembrandt painting because some people believed it was um, someone else that painted it. It was like an oh. understudy. And so it, that created its whole other controversy once people started looking into it. Um, but it was, in fact, I mean, it was, in fact, the paintings. Clearly, they had not been taken care of. <laughs> yeah, it has to have been someone that was just out of their depth, like someone that um, obviously yeah. didn't have the means to really take care of the paintings mm -hmm. properly, but also didn't have the means to move them. Exactly. So, you know, it's one of those things where you're like, yeah, you know, like if, if I was able to go steal a painting that was worth a million dollars, what the heck would I do with it? Yeah, then what? Yeah, like I have I mean, no connections for, you know, trying to sell that. Am I going to put it on Craigslist? No. I know. <laughs> and that's that's what the FBI was saying in San Francisco police. They were like, anyone who takes a painting like this and like they've usually done it before and they have connections to sell it under the radar, you know. Right. right. And that's why they were thinking Hitman or not like Hitman, but like hired. this was yeah, yeah. hired uh, because that's the only thing that kind of makes sense. Some big wig just wanted to say they had it and could show it off. And so they hired someone to take it. It was a contract. Yeah. But... I mean, based on that, it was it was sloppy. It really is like they took this article and mm -hmm. they were like, all right, let's act it out. Here we go. And then totally had no idea what to do with any of it afterwards. And then eventually was like, I got to give this back. Yeah, <laughs> I can't live yeah. with this anymore. <laughs> yep. I can't do it. So I think you're right, Danielle. I think we start it as a stage play. And mm -hmm. then I yeah. see a version starring Nicolas Cage as the art oh. thief that whose yes. heart grows yeah <laughs> yes please i'm telling you we're on to something here which, which let's be honest nicholas cage kind of looks like the grinch a little bit yeah. just a little bit nowadays yeah. mm -hmm. 100 percent <laughs> agree with that statement well as usual danielle our stories i mean th of course they're going to have themes we're looking mm -hmm. for a particular theme but even within that theme our stories have some connectivity that mm -hmm. i think you're going to appreciate but to hear mine, you're going to have to get on the other side of this commercial break where we thank our sponsors first. So please hang in there. We'll be right back. The holidays can be hectic and we don't want you to turn into a Grinch in the kitchen. 
HelloFresh gets rid of the stressful meal planning and brings your food right to your door with everything needed to pull together a delicious meal in about 30 minutes. Recipes like balsamic and fig beef tenderloin or pecan, pronounced exactly like that, crusted pecan. salmon pecan. make... I'm telling you, pecan crusted <laughs> salmon make holiday meals feel special without the high cost of dining out or delivery. They also have plenty of vegetarian and pescatarian meal options. This week, I had the hoisin sweet potato and mushroom bowl. Danielle? Sounds so good. The fregi the fregies. The fregies. We're they were calling fresh. Them that <laughs> yeah, they were fresh veggies, but they were fregies, full of flavor. And on top of that, they had um, sriracha sauce with it. So I was able to add as much as I wanted. I put the whole thing in there. Mm -hmm. It I was great. I would have done the same. And yeah. they're not just for meals. Check out the HelloFresh market for seasonal entertaining options like their holiday cheesecake and skinny dip dark chocolate peppermint almonds. Mmm. Not yeah. to mention the cookie dough. I'm just going to throw that back in there. I'm still eating the cookie dough. <laughs> Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime14 and use code CrimeAfterCrime14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. Spend more quality time with all your friends and family in Whoville with the help of HelloFresh. Go to HelloFresh.com slash CrimeAfterCrime14 and use code CrimeAfterCrime14 for up to 14 free meals and three free gifts. Try America's number one meal kit right now. All right, you guys, welcome back. I cannot wait to hear this. I feel like it's very interesting finding these parallels between the Grinch and these stories. It's kind of odd how similar these stories are mine so far. I kept seeing these connections and I was like, wait a minute, this is bizarre. <laughs> and so I can't, I cannot wait to see what your Grinch does. Yeah. Let's, let's get ready for some more Grinchy connections. One of the most terrifying aspects of the Grinch story for me is thinking about someone invading people's homes mm -hmm. to shatter a family's sense of security and safety in that way is just truly terrible. But to do that during the holiday season, just takes things to a whole other level. Now, I knew what type of story I needed to find for this Grinch competition, but I had no idea where it would lead me. I also had to go back in time, Danielle. 1981, Ronald Reagan had just become president, post-it notes became a thing, and we all fell in love with a fictional archeologist named Indiana Jones who steals things by the way, but I, I won't mm -hmm. go off on that right now. Mm -hmm. Oh, and <laughs> A six-year-old John Lorden was dreaming of his future as a YouTube and podcast host. Can't leave that out. Just a little note, yeah. <laughs> but for one special family staying at their winter home in Montego Bay on the north coast of Jamaica, the holidays of 1981 would be unforgettable and not necessarily for good reasons. It was Monday, December 21st, just after 7 p.m. when the family sat down for dinner. The former sugar plantation known as Cinnamon Hill was originally built in 1747, but now was a lavish home sitting on a hillside overlooking Montego Bay. Obviously, Danielle, this family had a little cash, right? Mm -hmm. Actually, they had a lot of cash. You see, this was country music star Johnny Cash's family. <laughs> no, that's perfect. <laughs> now, for anyone out there, because I know we've got listeners of all ages if you don't know who johnny cash is do yourself a favor watch yes. the film walk the line with mm -hmm. joaquin phoenix you'll absolutely thank mm -hmm. us later it is a great great film uh johnny and his wife june carter cash were there with their 11 year old child john carter cash a friend of the boys named doug caldwell johnny's sister rebecca uh or sorry reba hancock reba's husband chuck husey and an archaeologist friend of theirs named Indiana Jones, no, named Ray <laughs> Fremer. <laughs> and Indiana Jones appeared. <laughs> uh, on top of that, they had house staff that was there. I think it was three in total. And then one of the house staff had brought her daughter as well. Um, so they're there to take care of the family's needs. So in case you don't know, and I remember this from being a kid, Johnny Cash and Christmas, like, they go together mm -hmm. like like eggnog and rum. Yum. He had just released another new Christmas album, which he seemed this to is do. This like pre-Mariah Carey days. Yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. Mariah learned it from yeah. like, you know, Dolly Parton and Johnny Cash. Like Christmas albums were just popping all over the yep. place. Mm-hmm. He had just released one called Classic Christmas. Uh, one reviewer wrote, Cash takes stabs at joy to the world and friends. Since he can't stay in tune, those stabs prove to be fatal. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Reviewers were salty back then, Daniel. <laughs> Dang. Man, I thought things were bad now. That was yeah. outright drama right there. Well, it used to be. Yeah, I mean, you would consider them being a critic. And it mm-hmm. used to be that critics were generally like super critical, like even if, if it wasn't really called for. <laughs> um, but there was also the Johnny Cash Christmas special, which aired on television just a few days before. Johnny and his family took the audience to Scotland to learn about the Cash family roots. Uh, Johnny shared his love of Christmas with a worldwide audience. And of course, that was a reflection of the special holiday time that he made with his family. So with his career thriving in full swing at this point, he had shows literally scheduled for the following week, uh, including one on New Year's Eve with like Chuck Berry and Bob Hope. Um, But he was settling down for dinner with his family on this night. Now, what the Cash family didn't realize was that as they were sitting down to the table to have this holiday meal together, three men were entering the home through a side door and these men were armed. One man had a knife, one had a hatchet, and the third had a pistol. So these guys are taking it to even a, a scarier level than the Grinch. Yeah. Mm-hmm. The hatchet's it, kind of frightening. Yeah. Uh, in his book, Cash, Johnny says, we didn't have guards back then or yeah. locked doors. Like it's just something it just it would have never occurred to you. Uh, as the Cash family were literally about to bless their meal, and some instances of this story said they had literally started their blessing already, mm-hmm. all of a sudden the men rush in, each of them coming in from a different door, and they have their faces obscured by nylon stockings. One of the men yells, somebody's going to die here tonight. Oh, that's horrifying. And Johnny said the housekeeper went down, just immediately fainted, <laughs> right down. We want a million dollars or someone is going to die. Johnny only had a few thousand dollars in cash. It was in a briefcase that was under the bed. He told the men, like, you can't bring that kind of money into Jamaica. Like, you can't just, hey, I've got a no, million what do you dollars. Think I'm carting this around. Like, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But he also told them that they could take whatever he had there. Mm-hmm. Uh, Moments later, the housekeeper was coming back around and she kept screaming she was having a heart attack. One of the men let another house staff member go and get her some water. Uh, The men started removing the jewelry from everyone. Johnny's wife, June, initially when she saw what was going on, she was trying to cover up her watch and rings, but of course they saw that. Mm -hmm. Uh, She said she was also having chest pains and told them that she had a heart condition. At that moment, the guy with the gun grabbed little Doug Caldwell, the friend of 11-year-old John Carter Cash. He puts the gun to Doug's head and says, everybody do as I say, or John Carter is going to die. He's got the wrong kid. He ordered everyone to get to their feet, and then he noticed, oh, there's another 11-year-old. Oh, wait, no, that's John Carter over there. So then he shoves Doug aside, and then he goes and gets John Carter cash and puts the gun to his head. So at this point, the men took each person from the group individually uh, into each room, to collect the valuables that they knew that that particular person yeah. knew about. This goes on for more than two hours, Danielle. Oh man. Can you imagine? And you know, like each one of those minutes felt like an absolute eternity. Yes. Well, and your son has a gun being held to his head yeah. for most of this as well. Yeah. Uh, as the time wore on, Johnny said, He noticed that the men seemed to be getting calmer and calmer, which he was feeling good about because he's just looking for this thing to de-escalate. They even started calling Johnny Cash, sir, and asking how long the family was going to be in town. Johnny, when he felt like things were opening up there a little bit, he asked, hey, guys, can you please take the gun away from my son's Mm -hmm. head? And while the gunman wouldn't necessarily do that, uh, Johnny said that the way that he responded to him was pretty clear. The guy said, don't worry about it, man. 
And Johnny felt like that was a sign of, okay, these guys aren't yeah. really here to hurt us necessarily. But just after he was feeling safe from the gunman's comment, uh, the gunman said something to little John Carter that seemed kind of off. He sa- he tells the kid, uh, this is a real gun I've got against your head, you know. And John Carter responds, I go hunting with my dad sometimes. I know guns. So Johnny's gut, he's just going nuts. He's like, what the hell is this about? Where is this going? Yeah, exactly. The gunman then asked if John uh, Carter, little John, wanted to feel the gun. And John Carter replied, no, sir, I don't play with guns. I have a lot of respect for them. They're very dangerous. And at that, the gunman smiled and said, hey, I, I like you, man. So right off that moment, Johnny Cash notices just another big decrease in the tension after that exchange. The, you know, the energy in the room is just coming down even more. And he also wrote in his book, he was very proud of his son for uh, not just how smart the response was, yeah, I was but about to for say. How, how calm he was through this whole thing. Mm-hmm. I mean, this kid's got a gun being held to his head through this whole thing. Um, I don't even think me. I, I don't. <laughs> I wouldn't even say something that like. I know. I know. Yeah. <laughs> I would just be like, help. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I am. I'm over here like blown away by this young man. Way yeah. to go. Yeah. Um, so after the men collected all the loot, they also, and here we go, let's start drawing some Grinch parallels. Uh oh. They took all the food and liquor from the kitchen. Must have been good food. <laughs> Not only that, they even took the dinners that were served on the table. <laughs> Who even thinks to go that far? This is. This is a real Grinch thing, like where he comes and steals the roast beast. Yeah, remember? Like every piece coming off the table, going into the bag. Yeah. No. They literally took the food that was served on the table. Couldn't Uh, even leave them their plates. Yeah. Then they tell the family that they're going to be locked in the cellar. And Reba and June basically start freaking out. Like mm-hmm. they're, you know, they're thinking, oh no, this is, this could be the end of it. But Johnny actually is thinking this is probably a sign that we're going to make it through this ordeal. Because yeah. if they wanted to kill us, they would just kill us here. There's mm-hmm. no point in taking us down to the cellar. Um, so the family was led down to the basement and they were locked in. And I'm not kidding, Danielle. This is coming directly from Johnny Cash himself. A moment later, one of the men returned and slid a plate of turkey under the door. He told them, we want you people to have your Christmas dinner after all. We don't want to take that away from you. And his heart grew three sizes that day. (laughs) I am impressed, man. And I'm just in here picturing their conversation upstairs like, dang, do we give him some turkey? (laughs) Yeah, no, I'm gonna go back. I mean, look, we got all the other stuff. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to give him the turkey. Give him the turkey. Is that is three pieces enough turkey? Should we yeah. add like a couple? <laughs> no, no, <laughs> don't give him, yeah, don't give him the white stuff though. Yeah. <laughs> don't give yeah. him the breast. Dark meat only. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Give him. Okay. We'll give him a leg. <laughs> <laughs> I just picture that conversation and yeah. it would be such an interesting thing to hear. <laughs> yeah. But we're saving the pecans. Yes. Pecans. Perfect. <laughs> Pecans uh, are for truck drivers. Oh, that's right. That's right. Mm-hmm. Uh, so, Danielle, the crooks took almost $6,000 in cash, okay. plus other valuables, including jewelry. Mm-hmm. One item in particular was Johnny's diamond studded watch, which was valued at $25,000 itself. Wow. In another Grinch like move, They took 175 pairs of shoes that were supposed to be donated to a Jamaican orphanage by the Cashes for Christmas. That's a lot of shoes. 175 pair, and they took them all. The total haul was estimated at between $35,000 and $50,000 in property stolen. The crooks left the estate in June Carter Cash's Land Rover. So they loaded Mm. up the Land Rover with all the shoes, all the food all the stolen items and took off. Now, an interesting aspect is they actually had dogs on the property. So, you know, yeah, they didn't have guards. They didn't really lock Mm -hmm. the door, but they had dogs. And Johnny always wondered why they only heard the dogs bark when the men were leaving. They didn't Mm. hear the dogs bark before the attack. Now, he doesn't necessarily think it was an inside job 
but he thought that the crew might have been people that were around the home regularly in some way. Yeah. And that the dogs became accustomed to them because he thought okay. it was just really, really weird for them to not be, you know, barking at, at them coming mm-hmm. in. So they're locked in this basement. Johnny and his brother in law eventually break down the basement door. And then house staff takes the other family Land Rover into town to notify the authorities of what's happened. Now, in his book, Johnny actually goes into the aftermath. Uh, He outlined the swift justice that happened around this, possibly because the Jamaican authorities were terrified of this type of news damaging their fragile and lucrative tourism industry. Yeah. Like, if I remember right, like the president of the country, like, posted an apology immediately, you know, directly to Johnny and all this stuff. So they were pretty concerned about that. Mm -hmm. He was told something by a local policeman on the day of the robbery that kind of took on a bit of a different meaning in the following weeks. Quote, don't worry, Mr. Cash. These people will never trouble you or your family again. You can count on it. Johnny later learned they caught the gunman that same night. Are you serious? He died resisting arrest. Are you serious? Mm-hmm. The other two, caught a few weeks later in another robbery attempt, went to prison, then somehow died while they were trying to escape. Johnny says it's his understanding that they were given a ladder by people that worked at the prison And it was actually the same guards that gave him the ladder. They were just waiting on the other side of the fence for them to come Mm -hmm. over. And then, oops, well, yeah, they were trying to get out. Oh, my gosh. Yeah. So Johnny, who himself, you know, he struggled with the law, drugs, alcohol, um, you know, often played music for prisoners, even recorded one of his most popular albums in Folsom in a jail. He had a really unique perspective on all this. Mm -hmm. Quote, For quite a while, I brooded. I felt victimized and guilty. I took sleeping pills. I carried a gun. In time, though, those reactions faded. I'm out of answers. My only certainties are that I grieve for desperate young men and the societies that produce and suffer so many of them. Exactly. I felt that I knew these boys. I knew how they thought. I knew how they needed. They were like me. I was about to say there's like the sense of like you feel bad for them because like you could clearly see there were they were doing something bad but there were these moments of like trying to do something good within they it stole... and usually like serious criminals there you're not going to see that yeah yeah no no johnny really and like, i can see how he yeah he he, he connects with them mm-hmm. but also in his retelling of it he really humanizes them as well that's why i kind of left some of that in like where um you know his um housekeeper faints and yeah, then they let she's water. Mm-hmm. yeah and then they let someone else go and get water there was just this constant de-escalation that he was noticing and he was mm-hmm. noting as he was recalling it that i wanted to kind of make you know pull into this story thread as well yeah. to, to really get that um point at the end that he makes because quite honestly like when i read that paragraph i was like whoa like it just took the story to a whole different place for mm-hmm. me um, the Cash family left Jamaica two days later. They actually wound up spending Christmas at their primary home in Hendersonville, Tennessee. But news of the robbery hit the press with such clever headlines as Cash loses cash, Johnny cashless, <laughs> and gunmen take Johnny's cash. But Johnny Cash made it a point to keep that second home at Cinnamon Hill and He kept visiting Jamaica with his family, even for Christmas, but they did hire guards. They did lock the doors. He notes that on future visits, the locals would see him and say, respects, Mr. Cash, respects, which he believed was due to him not giving up on the people or the country of Jamaica. Yeah. Big thank you to SavingCountryMusic.com, ThePeopleHistory.com, UPI.com, The Tennessean, The LA Times, The Times News, and of course, the autobiography Cash by Johnny Cash, which um, I was able to find, and it looked like a legit version that was online. I yeah. think you can you can read it online. And that in, just talking about that particular story mm-hmm. was only a few pages of it, but I got to tell you, he's so likable just in yeah. terms of reading his words and stuff. Uh, I will probably get back to that book. Um, 
comparisons to the Grinch. I think John Carter Cash, Cindy Lou Who. I think there's uh-huh. a little a little yep. lineup there. Oh uh, man, I was about to say that nailed it. The dogs. I know. Accomplice, maybe. Maybe they're trying to help the criminals. I you don't never know. know. <laughs> um, of course, literally stealing the food from the kitchen table. Like that's. <laughs> that is so crazy to me. Yeah. I mean uh, that, and then like the mass amount of shoes. Yeah, 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 yeah. Like, that took some effort. I'm just saying. That took some yeah. effort to get all those shoes out. <laughs> but to your point, also shows about what type of robbery this was. Yeah. Like, oh, we've got a bunch of shoes, probably a lot of them in children's sizes. Like, we're going to take all those, too. Where, what do you think they're going to do with them? Exactly. You know? It's, yeah. you know, like what I mentioned at the beginning of my story. It's just doing it to do it and not so much thinking, like, what am I going to do with all this stuff after? Right. Not like it's good to steal, but like, is it even going to benefit you? Or are you just literally taking what you can because you can? Right. And of course, you have the the moment with the plate of roast beast being slid yep. under the door. And finally, from what I understand, the Grinch was also killed in a prison escape attempt after being set up by the cat in the hat. So that's, that's probably the strongest <laughs> connection right there. <laughs> oh, my gosh. I can't believe that. Man, I, imagine how scary that was and then how conflicted he was afterwards knowing, mm-hmm. you know, their ultimate fate and Yeah, yeah. I wouldn't yeah. sleep at night after that. Yeah, he kind of commented on that a little bit too. He's like I, I he's like I can't almost like he didn't even want to venture into trying to understand what justice is like yeah, exactly. he was he was kind of troubled by that. You could tell a little bit in how he wrote about it that it was just like you know, um, this is a whole different other big conversation to have because well, it's not the same as what would happen here in the U.S. probably. But even that alone reminds me of Cindy Lou Who because no one else wanted to give anyone a chance. But there was this like hope there. Yeah. You know, when this understanding that she had, you nailed it. That was good. That that was good. Yeah. Well, um, interestingly, uh, John Carter, when Johnny said uh, whenever they asked him about it, uh he was never really hung up on it all that much he would just Mm -hmm. be kind of like oh yeah that was a crazy night wasn't it and uh (laughs) yeah johnny's sister uh reba yeah never went back to jamaica wouldn't just would not go back yeah yeah we all react to things differently yeah yeah but wow so that's it. That's the one I was so happy when I found that story. I was like, I can't wait to tell this to Danielle. Johnny Cash, you would. Johnny Cash. You would. You know, I, I didn't like... even stumble upon that in my research. And the level of different search terms that I somehow pulled out of my butt to find a story. <laughs> I got super lucky. I got super lucky because I found only like one write up on it. Yeah. And I was like, is this real? And quite <laughs> this honestly. Is it real? This is fake. Yeah, and some of the stuff in that write-up, I couldn't corroborate with uh, Johnny's information, so I leaned yeah. way more into his version. And quite honestly, Johnny even got like the year wrong on his. But cause, <laughs> well, because I also looked up the articles, I was like, oh wow, the news is writing about this in yeah. December of of 1981. He thought it happened in 1982, but you know, of course, it's just it's, well, it's a you year know. Off. We also talk about going into the new year and having no idea what year it is. That's true. And not remembering. So I feel like we're all just struggling in terms of that. What I year mean, is it? Yeah. I know. It's like how everyone's like, you guys realize like how long 2000 was, like mm-hmm. how long ago that was. And I'm like, what? That was, oh my gosh. <laughs> Wait a <Yeah>. minute. <laughs> yeah. That was a while ago. Yeah, it was a while ago. As usual, we also bumped into extra stories, things mm-hmm. that we couldn't flesh out for the whole story or the big story, but uh, we're going to do one of those right now, starting with Danielle. This one is the most me thing that I've seen in all of this research, and that that says a lot. I've looked into some crazy stuff, <laughs> but this is like a level of petty that I would get to. So in 2017, Texas homeowner Ken Lampkins went all out with his Christmas decorations. He had inflatables. It was like a whole line of reindeer. There were lights galore, and he couldn't wait to watch the joy on everyone's face as they passed by. But one morning, he awoke to everything gone. A Grinch had been determined to destroy Christmas and took Mm. all of his decorations from his front yard. But instead of letting that get him down, and this reminds me of the moment around the Christmas tree and the Grinch. Yeah. He decided to change a change up in decorations was in order. Instead of inflatable reindeer and sparkling lights, 
he replaced each reindeer with a massive wanted poster with a night vision image of the thief that stole his display. <laughs> what? He did. And not just that, a projector was set up. Not to play snowflakes on repeat like at my house, but instead to play the thief in action. The video? That, yes, the video footage of it <laughs> to the tune of You're a Mean One, Mr. Grinch. Yeah, I like this guy. I know, me too. That's what I'm saying. I'm like, oh, this is great. <laughs> I'm over here like, someone take take my stuff. Let me capture you so I can like plaster you. <laughs> and even though this, you know, wasn't traditional Christmas decor, the neighbors surely got a kick out of all of these new decorations. But unfortunately, the thief was never caught. Mm. However, I can imagine there's a chance he may have driven by and been like, oh, boy. Yeah. Or even his family driven by. Hey, yeah. doesn't that look like... <laughs> Imagine families that are going out like I I don't know if everyone does this. I do. Like I will go out multiple nights in December yeah. late at night with my hot cocoa and I just go look at Christmas lights. And then oh, imagine yeah. driving by and you're like, huh. Yeah. Hmm. Don't I know that kid? <laughs> <laughs> this house is weird. These reindeer are actually the same man over and over again. <laughs> I like it. I like it. That sucks that the uh, person got away with it, though. Poor mm -hmm. guy lost all his decorations. Yeah. And, you know, that stuff can get expensive. Like, y y you spend years getting to the point where you can have a presentation like that. And, it's yeah. something else. Yeah. Well, Danielle, in December of 2012, in Lancaster, South Carolina, police came up on a vehicle around 7.50 p.m., and they ran the plates... Not only did the plates not match the car, but those plates had been called in as stolen. Mm -mm. But police would soon be wondering if anything else was stolen when the trunk popped open and four kids jumped out. Merry Christmas. <laughs> and they started singing. This is going to happen to my sister Christmas morning. <laughs> Raylan and Liam are just going to pop out of her trunk and be like, surprise, and be like, you're welcome. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Just don't have them do that when the police have pulled pulled you yes, over. Yes, not a good idea. Uh, the driver, William Benton, turned out to be the father of at least two of the children that were in the trunk. Quote, anybody knows me knows I always take care of my children. It's as, as if they were hogtied, bound, and forced to be in there. No one was forced. It wasn't like I left them for eight hours while I went into Walmart in 100-degree heat and dying back there. What? <laughs> Comparison. I mean, I'm telling you. <laughs> oh man, he's got a point. I mean, he's got, got a point. He yeah. didn't leave him in the back of the car at Walmart in a hundred degree weather. At Walmart for eight hours and a hundred yeah. degrees. That's like very specific. <laughs> yeah. But what 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 did happen? Well, yeah. Benton said that they were all at a holiday parade, and when the parade ended, he didn't have quite enough room to get everyone home, so. Some of the kids had to ride in the trunk for the roughly five-minute trip. Now, officials told the press that the kids were in the trunk for transport purposes only. No foul play here. Just extremely poor judgment. <laughs> My children are just in the trunk for transportation purposes only. Yeah, yeah. Benton was jailed overnight. Okay. And charged with child endangerment, possession of stolen property, because remember, the plates were stolen, operating, yeah, on and, earth. I know, uh, operating an uninsured motor vehicle and driving under suspension. So his license suspended as well. According to him, the stolen plate was put on the car and called in by a family member trying to get revenge on him. His life seems full of adventure. <laughs> Do you think that was the family member that he left in the trunk at Walmart? Maybe Probably. They <laughs> He's like recalling old memories. That was too specific. I'm telling you, there's something going on it here. It was, wasn't it? Yeah. It was way too specific. <laughs> yeah. When they when he opened it up, they were like, I was dying back there. And he's just recalling the whole story for the police. No. Yeah. Don't put your kids in the trunk, folks. I'm just no. going to say it plainly. I don't want to hear of anybody that listens to crime after crime driving around with your kids in the trunk. <laughs> yes. Please don't do that. Please do not. Oh, my gosh. All right, now, Danielle, you're up. I've got another fun one. This is another one where I wish I was a fly on the wall. So Riverside Police decided to conduct a holiday enforcement operation at the Canyon Springs Shopping Center to ward off any Grinches that were trying to cast a shadow on the spirit of the holiday. Mm. They did handle a few individuals, one woman, 
I want to point out was not me. May sound like it, but she basically strolled out of a Target with an entire cart full of goods. <laughs> okay. They were not paid for. Oh, that's a problem. Mine usually are. Yeah. Um, but <laughs> they got her and another man that was linked to multiple thefts in the area. And just as the officers were wrapping up, all pun intended, the Grinch of all Grinches reared his ugly green head again. All pun intended. Not just one, but three men were seen casing cars in the shopping center parking lot. But okay. what? Who is the Grinch's worst nightmare? I don't know. Santa Claus. Okay. Okay. The officers just so happened to be undercover in a Santa suit and elf costumes, and they ran in to save the day. The confusion on the carjackers' faces. Absolutely priceless. As Santa Claus himself... And his elves tackle them to the ground. Wow. Wow. Oh, yeah. I down. mean, yeah. Right. Like it. It's perfect. Yep. Two suspects were arrested. One unfortunately did get away in the stolen vehicle, but the magic of Christmas came through. The car was ultimately found, and this third Grinch was also arrested. All right. But imagine At first, seeing I thought that. they were going to, I thought that, I thought they were just trying to free children from trunks. <laughs> Open your trunk and let me get a good look. <laughs> Oh my gosh. But imagine how hilarious that would be. You're just standing there. I mean, I totally get it. It's a smart undercover idea. Well, we know cr we, criminals have used it. We yeah. know bank holdups dressed up as Santa exactly. Claus. And yeah. Yeah. Why not flip it the other way? Exactly. Then like, imagine you're thinking about taking a car and you look up and like Santa is full speed ahead. Mm -hmm. Charging at you. Yeah. With his elves in tow in the background. <laughs> Rudolph. I know. I like it. Oh my goodness. Uh, Danielle, there is this cute store in Mount Washington, Ohio, which if I ever happen to get there, I'm definitely going there based mm -hmm. on what I saw in these pictures. It's called O Smiley's Dolls and it's owned by Sherry Smiley. She buys, sells, and trades all sorts of collectibles, not just dolls, but you know, she has like superhero yeah. figures and like pop culture movie stuff and things like that. So when two men came in looking for a trade, you know, that's kind of normal business for her. Mm -hmm. But one thing that grabbed her attention is while one of the men was bargaining with her, the other kept walking out to his car and then mm -hmm. back into the store. And as a matter of fact, she felt kind of weird because one time he said, oh, I forgot my wallet. And then he went out and then he came back. And then another time he went, oh, I forgot my wallet. And then he went out and then he came back. Hi, excuse me, sir. How many wallets do you normally carry? Yeah. Yeah. Kind of tipped her off when he used the same excuse twice. Man, and you think you would be overthinking that. I know. Like I know. you know like, better. Well, well, that was weird. Um, there was no deal that was made and the men left, but Sherry felt really weird, especially after that two trips mm -hmm. to get the wallet. She checked her surveillance system and the men were indeed stealing from her store. They'd made off with 20 collectibles. But Sherry had plenty of footage, and she had really good cameras on top of that. And she decided she was going to take this case to social media. Boom. So, done. Solved. Yeah. <laughs> she puts a message out to the thieves saying, I've got this footage of you. You've got 24 hours to come back and bring everything back to my store, or I'm going to press charges. Oh, and by the way, not only do you have to bring everything back to my store, maybe you should donate $600 each that we could use to buy toys for children in need. Sherry Smiley scares me a little bit. <laughs> Seriously, seriously. She reminds me of like my grandmother and my grandmother, like you just like snap up into attention. She ain't playing around. Well, guess what happened? Did they seriously? They did it. They brought all the <laughs> toys back plus $600 each. <laughs> <laughs> I cannot believe that. Isn't that awesome? Man. Because yeah. they were probably scared too. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They're like, oh, no. It's like. Well, she'd been down this road before too, she said. Like, she's like, oh, my God. Like, the legal fees and all this nonsense you have to go through. I mean, she had. put my foot down. Yeah. She had an awesome camera system. I mean, you, you can't. There's. I couldn't see a way that you could get away with it with the, with the cameras that she had in there. Um, I just love that they actually did do 600. Yeah, yeah, they did. So not They're only, like, mm -mm. yeah, not only did they get everything back, but yeah, they had to pay to keep themselves out of jail, basically. Oh my gosh, <laughs> good for her. 
<laughs> I aspire to be like that one day. I do. I do too. She's awesome. that direct and serious about things. Oh my gosh. And effective. Within yeah. A day, it worked everything's perfect. Back. Yeah. Yep. I wonder if she was surprised by that or if she like knew they were going to do it. I don't, I don't know how, I don't know how you'd be surprised by it. I mean, when you had these types of photos, I mean, it was just a matter of time. Mm-hmm. Like they're going to get nailed. Yeah. So they had no choice. They really had no choice. <laughs> oh my goodness. This has been such an interesting episode, mm-hmm. <laughs> but who is going to win this month? You guys get to vote. Who told the best real life Grinch story? There was a lot of them too. All of these stories, they really resonated well. Yeah, yeah. And I didn't know if that was going to happen or not. Yeah, I wasn't sure either. And it really played yeah. pretty hard. Yeah, mm-hmm. I'm, I'm pretty happy with that. Uh, you can vote over on our Twitter account at Crime After Pod. And you can vote there for the first seven days after the episode drops. Or... You can also head to www.crimeaftercrimepodcast.com and vote there. We do have a link in the description box below that you can click on, or you can still click the letter I up in the corner of the screen, and that will take you to the website to vote. At Crime After Crime Podcast, you can find all the links you'll ever need, including where to find more content by Danielle and myself, how to suggest show topics, join our Patreon, or shop our Teespring store. And as always, a huge, huge thank you to our patrons. You guys are awesome. Every patron gets a bonus Patreon special segment monthly where John and I kind of dig a little bit deeper, talk about ourselves. I usually mm-hmm. tell some sort of crazy story about what's happening on my farm. Farm Plus update. Patreon, <laughs> exactly. Farm update. The Bobcat's not a Bobcat, just for all of you who aren't aware of what you're missing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Plus, patrons also get a personal shout out and an upcoming Patreon special. We are going to be back on January 1st, 2022. I can't believe it just came out of my mouth, but that's it. With the stories, two stories about the world's worst roommate. Mm. And for those of you that listened all the way through to the end. We may have something for you. Something a little special for you, I think, Danielle. Tell them about it. A little special, a little present. Yeah. Yeah. We also wanted to give you guys a little present this holiday season. In the show notes, you'll find a link to a reading of How the Grinch Stole Christmas by NBC Dateline's Keith Morrison. Now just take that in, folks. (laughs) Take it in. (laughs) Morrison doing How the Grinch Stole Christmas. And uh, there's not, there's a podcast version and a video version. We'll have both in the show notes. So beautiful. uh, Spend the 10 minutes. I I promise you, I promise you it's so worth it. He's he's an amazing person. (laughs) Wishing you all a happy holiday season. Thanks for supporting us this year. We truly appreciate it. We're going to see you again in the new year. Bye, guys. Thank you. 